اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم and a very warm welcome to world this morning I am your host Hachwa Sakti and joining me is my wonderful co-host Ahmad Nawaz السلام علیکم Ahmad Welcome السلام Where were you yesterday? Well I was a bit occupied and I must say that you know taking a break is not a thing you want to do because now today I need that cup of coffee just to get me going but you know wonderful to be back once again and I must say you look very purple and I love those dazzling earrings that you've got Thank you so Ahmed, I really wanted to ask you because you are a Twitter artist, right? Yeah. A very Twitter savvy person. And I think you can find Ahmed every time <laughs> on the Twitter because he's so well aware of what's going on in the uh, cyber But I don't system. have $20, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Is it $20 or $8? 8 and 20 <laughs> Okay, so please explain what are we talking well, about. Well, so uh, ever since Elon Musk has uh, taken over, uh, let that sink in has been the jargon. But now because there was a lot of talk about uh, verified accounts on Twitter, so Mr. Musk has come up with a strategy that for every verified account, you must be paying either $8 or $20 per month in subscription. And that will, of course, depends on the type of accounts that you've got and the reach and a lot of other factors that depend on them as well. Now, some people, of course, have tried to argue. And, you know, the best thing about Elon Musk is that he engages in every conversation. <laughs> right. So one of these people tweeted that, you know, this is absolutely absurd, da 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 and, of course, he was a verified account. So Elon Musk actually wrote underneath that uh, Twitter comment. He said, uh, thank you for your suggestions. Now, please pay $8. So <laughs> I, I guess I like the fact. But I think, Ahmed, the fact is that the blue trick uh, was a, a good tool against mm -hmm. the misinformation and disinformation. Now, if anyone can buy it, that means that uh, filter is now vanished, right? No, but the criteria would still be there. To get your account verified, there are a set of steps that you need to follow. And there is a whole okay. process. And then Twitter takes about five to ten working days to work on your application, on your request, okay. and then they get back to you. But uh, there, this has sparked a lot of debate, especially in the Western circles, about how they need to even pay their bills regarding the electricity, regarding the gas, and they don't have extra money to pay mm -hmm. for the blue ticks. But then again, I think it's a tool that anyone can use, mm -hmm. and of course, the people who are well, rich they can just come to Telegram then. <laughs> <laughs> they can switch to Telegram. Yeah. But the fact is that all of these social media applications, you know, are now on a different level, especially when you talk right. about. Uh, Twitter, Hajra, I think right. it is, it has become the, the real deal now in this world. True, true. And I think a lot of people are getting their political information from the Twitter. And it's a mm. very influential platform, yep. especially for the politics. Absolutely. So moving on to another, uh, when we're talking about the influential uh, media, social media platforms and influential personalities. So our uh, director, Saab, who happens to be on Sahi Saab, uh, he has uh, got the award, Ahmed, mm -hmm. because the Chief Justice of Pakistan, Umar Atta Bandeyal, visited the Secretariat of the Law and Justice Commission of Pakistan to chair the official launching ceremony of the documentary, Adliya Ka Safar, 75 years. Uh, basically, the documentary was prepared for the 9th International Judicial Conference recently held in September 2022. The Chief Justice was accompanied by his uh, fellow judges, Justice Aminuddin Khan, Justice uh, Muhammad Ali Mazar, and Justice Aisha Malik, who supervised the activities of the conference as the members of the organizing committee. On the occasion, the Chief Justice of Pakistan appreciated the efforts of the Secretariat of Law and Justice Commission and Pakistan television team for coming up with such a wonderful documentary that covers the judicial history of 75 years since the independence of Pakistan Chief mm -hmm. Justice also expressed his hope that PTV would keep on supporting um, the Secretariat in other similar report reports Absolutely. to create awareness amongst the general yes, public. Yes, the documentary was titled Adliya Safar Pachatar Sal and it was uh, a very intriguing one. And you know, Director Current Affairs and in charge of PTV World on Sai Saab has come up with a vision where, uh, you know, uh, streamlining all of these modern media techniques into promoting uh, the true and real image of Pakistan, not just Pakistan television. Look, this is one of the biggest platforms and a historic platform for Pakistan. So I think utilizing all its resources has been the hallmark so far of Mr. Sai's career. True, true. So Ahmad, uh, have you become a morning person yet? Absolutely. Okay. I think I'm getting up even if there's no morning show and I'm <laughs> like, where is Hajra? Okay. So you know, that is happening. But uh, talk me through your research now. What do we have on the show today? Okay, so Ahmed, I really wanted to, before we go on to our research and this start our segment, mm -hmm. I really wanted to talk about how the smog is uh, again cropping up in Islamabad. And if you wake up early in the morning, especially to offer the Fajr prayers, you will mm -hmm. observe that there's so much smog there. Yep. And especially in the Lahore, it is very much prudent and mm -hmm. it, it is 
uh, I mean, choking the um, throats of the people there. Yeah, air raids, yes. Right? Uh, so to talk about more, uh, we have a packet there. It has been made, prepared by our team because I feel visual representation seems more conv convincing mm -hmm. than talking out. Let's right? take a look at this report. Lahore is under the shadow of smog again. Once termed the city of gardens, the air quality level of provincial capital is continuously falling. The government's own data shows the worst air quality of Lahore at 309. The air is only safe to breathe if the air quality index is up to 50. Doctors advise citizens to make some changes in their daily routine to avoid smog. Smog is a visible form of air pollution uh, that uh, arises due to uh, over emission of some primary pollutants like hydrocarbons, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitric oxides. When these components react with atmosphere, they produce very dangerous and carcinogenic components. Smoke in human beings causes certain diseases, diseases of cardiovascular, respiratory, skin infections, and eye infections. Uh, the problem is due to uh, major pollutants found in the air and it's uh, it's causing major issues like respiratory problems, cardiovascular problems and uh, even the patient who have chronic conditions like cancer, they also are being affected by this. Uh, all we have to do is avoid the outdoor meetings uh, and uh, wear the mask and uh, just wash our face and hands, especially when coming from outside. Uh, this is the way how we can control the Smog in Lahore is caused by a combination of vehicle and industrial emissions, the burning of crop residue, general waste, and dust from the construction sites. Other factors of air pollution include large-scale losses of trees to build new roads and buildings. Air pollution can cause serious health hazards. Now it's Punjab government's responsibility to take immediate action in this regard. Reporting for PTV World, this is Muhammad Junaid. Right, that was a report uh, from Mohammed Junaid that details uh, what's been happening uh, during the past couple of years. The situation of, of smog has gotten worse, and that's why it's very, very important. I think the use of face masks will, will once again gain importance, but I think there are a lot of measures that the government will be taking to ensure uh, that uh, these measures, uh, you know, control that spread and that uh, density of smog so that people cannot suffer as they have in the past. Right, MS, so moving on to our uh, starting the segment, and yeah. I would really like to introduce our guest because she has written a wonderful book, and she wants to change the mindsets of the people mm -hmm. and actually talk about the positivity that we should harbor in the society, and that is actually there in the society. Mm -hmm. So to talk more about her and about her book, I'm very glad that we have been joined by Barrister Huma Price, who happens to be Barrister in the UK, and she's not just a Barrister, she has a lot of feathers to her cap. She's also a broadcaster, and she's also an author. So assalamu alaikum, madam, and thank you so much for coming to our show. Wa alaikum assalam and assalam alaikum Pakistan. Well, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well. Thank you. Well, great to have you. And uh, as Hajra mentioned, I think the jargon for today has got to be positivity. And as she mentioned that it is there, it's all about realizing that it's there. Yes. I think what happens sometimes is that we tend to get taken in by labels that we hear here and there. We take them on and start using them without the awareness that those labels may be influencing other people. And that's why we have to be very careful what language we mm -hmm. use. So um, if I could tell you how I came upon the idea of writing this book, I'm going to ask you a question mm -hmm. rather before you ask me a question. Would you like to live for over 100 years with good health and happiness? Absolutely. Would you like to live for over 100 years with good no, health? No, I don't <laughs> think so. So would you, would you think a lot of people out there would want to die young of illnesses yes. and sadness? I, I mean, I don't want to die with an <laughs> illness. I want to die as a young and a healthy person, but I feel that I want to die at around 40, 50 years, not more than that. Right, okay. Well, I think you're possibly in a minority because if you speak to people who are 80, 90, even they want to carry on living. Yes. So I came upon a research by Harvard University, uh, which was all about how people can live for a long time with good health mm -hmm. and happiness. Now, when we talk about health, people associate it with gyms, uh, with protein shakes, mm -hmm. and, and a lot about the kind of food. The physical thing. It's yeah. all very physical. Mm -hmm. But in this research, which went on for 80 years, and also included, incidentally, uh, President Kennedy, he was also part of this research, they have found that the main thing that affects our health, happiness, and long life are good interpersonal relationships. 
This means relationships with our husband, wife, mother, father, daughters, son, friends, colleagues, and also everybody that we come across in our life. If those relationships are positive and they fulfill us, then we are happy and we are healthier and we live for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought that is a very useful thing to write about, uh, but I've also come across another stereotype recently after I've started publicizing the book. When you write a book, people presume that it's all about what you think, what you believe. In fact, this book, which is 400 pages, possibly not even 10 pages include, other than the preface, which is very personal, none of it is about what I think. And you can't say, I've suffered this, therefore this must be what every woman is going through. Mm -hmm. That is not true either. This book is based upon research, and it's mainly research by psychologists about many things. And it's also based on uh, people of knowledge, people of information, and what they have found. For example, um, Hajra was talking about children and their upbringing with me. Uh, and I have written a whole chapter about how to raise children. And because I live in the West, uh, I didn't want to be labeled as someone who's promoting Western values. So I have based this whole chapter on children on a poem by Khalil Gibran in his book, The Prophet. Mm -hmm. And he covers the four aspects of children's upbringing. And we tend not to realize that there are, in fact, four aspects to all of us, especially when we raise our children. We have to focus on their physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual upbringing. And so the whole chapter I've taken from his uh, poem called, Your Children Are Not Your Children. And I've taken one stanza and then written in detail about it using research from psychologists. Uh, and if anybody reads this chapter, it is my challenge that they will raise happy, healthy, and successful children if they read this, this, uh, this chapter. Mm -hmm. Now, there are also a lot of stereotypes in society. And I've noticed, particularly in Pakistani society, there are a lot of stereotypes. Um, I come here very often. I come at least twice a year. And last time I was here, I w noticed the, uh, the march, the women march. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of um, things that caught my interest because there was a slogan, uh, my body, my choice, mera jism, meri marzi. And it was being bandied about as something. Nobody explained what it was all about, what its origin was. Nobody really understood. So I realized what happens in Pakistan is people pick up from social media phrases and terms and then use them without knowing the full history, the full background, and what context they should be used in. Mm -hmm. So for example, this My Body, My Choice was a slogan that Western women used when they wanted to, uh, when they wanted to influence lawmakers about what stage of their pregnancy they should have an abortion at. Because in the West, there are, there are very strict uh, mm -hmm. time limits as to when a woman can abort and when she can't. And women wanted to control that time limit. So they said, my body, my choice as to when I have an abortion. And this was taken out of context and used in all sorts of different ways. Now, um, a lot of people uh, have criticized me for the book being liberal or, or being uh, Western. In fact, every single thing in this book is about South Asian society and South Asian role models. But I've had criticism even before they read it. They haven't I read it. The I people who criticize <laughs> haven't read it. Now, for example, I, I have written the book to challenge stereotypes in the West as well as the East. Mm. So in the West, there is this stereotype that all Asian women are oppressed, particularly Muslim women. And Muslim women uh, are kept in the house and they haven't done anything. So I found that in 1813, Bhopal was ruled by a Muslim woman, mm -hmm. Kutsia Begum, I think her name was. And her husband had been shot. And she talked to uh, the scholars at the time and the British who were in power and said, I can rule as a woman after my husband. She negotiated with them. And Muslim women ruled for four generations after her. Her daughter took over after her, then her granddaughter took after her, and then her great-granddaughter took after her. And to make this relevance to the current generation, these are the grandmothers of Saif Ali Khan, the Bollywood actor. Mm -hmm. They ruled Bhopal, and they didn't just rule it in a, in a very superficial way. One of them sorted out the entire sewage and water system in Bhopal. Mm -hmm. 
Another one of them sorted out the entire judiciary in Bhopal and the judicial system. Another one who was a poet, she actually compiled an anthology of poetry uh, and had that published. And a lot of work was done around literature and poetry in her time. So these women not only ruled, they made a difference and they left a mark. So I challenge Western stereotypes. Now, another um, misconception I have come across very often is the one between patriarchy and misogyny. Mm -hmm. Now, women in Pakistan think patriarchy is something very oppressive, very dominant. But actually, if you look at history, patriarchy is men protecting and providing for women. There is no dominance there because when we talk about male-female roles, nobody can deny that women have children. And when they get pregnant and have children, they're vulnerable. And they need a man to protect them. Usually the man who's made them pregnant whose children they're mm -hmm. having. They need that man to protect them. Protecting women, providing for them, looking after the children, providing them, that's patriarchy. Mm. And I'll tell you something very funny. In one or two places where I have uh, talked, uh, I took a box of chocolates for everybody. And one of the guys said, I'm going to keep this for my daughter. That's patriarchy. A man thinking of his daughter, providing for her. That's patriarchy. Now, controlling women, preventing them from progressing, that's misogyny. Uh, have you eaten those chocolates already? <laughs> Am I late there? You know, that, that, that opens it. How do, wh what, what do you think is, is that real difference that is being made when we're hearing this discussion right now? I think I uh, totally agree with you, and I do feel mm. that uh, there's a lot of, what do you call, criticism coming on the patriarchy, and especially that the men are aggressive in nature, mm. and that's a scientifically proven fact. But I do feel if you, like ma'am has mentioned, that if you look at the Islamic ideals, I do feel that aggression can be channeled in order to tackle the oppression in the society, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's not a bad thing at all. Uh, it can be tackled, it can be channeled to tackle the oppression, uh, mm -hmm. the injustice and all the wrong and uh, evil doings that are going on mm -hmm. inside the society. So when I'm talking more about the parents and the kids relationship, I want to I want you to comment on it that how important it is to have a healthy relationship inside our homes because that impacts the and influences our kids mental health being and that is reflected when he's interacting with the society out there when he goes mm -hmm. out to the school and of course Ahmed is a uh, father he can better understand yeah. that so absolutely comment. absolutely mm. it is said in the West that uh, well in fact I believe somebody very famous said give me a child from naught to ten and I'll give you a human being. Mm -hmm. So I believe whatever we become depends on the first 10 years experience we have, okay. which ob obviously relates to our families and how they bring us up. Now, um, I, I live in the West. I've lived in London since I was 10 years old. But I find that um, when I come to Pakistan, I find families are very loving. They're very caring towards each other. I find that the parents will do anything for their children. Uh, and children uh, also revere their parents. This is my general ex you know, experience of Pakistan. Right, right. Whereas in the West, uh, parents encourage their children to become independent, mm -hmm. and children are very independent. They move away from the family mm -hmm. very true, quickly. True. Now, there is love and affection in both. Cultures are different. So going back to patriarchy and, and misogyny, again, but, but then again, madam, there is this thing which is being cultivated in the West that the kids knows the best, and you do not need to interfere in their domain, right? As a parent, how much it is important do you think that we need to guide our children and make sure they are okay, and then we are balancing that? Take interest, basically. Right, uh, I right. I think there's probably a difference between Western and Eastern culture, because in the West, the parents believe that it is their responsibility to shape their children from naught to five. As soon as they go to school, it becomes the teacher's responsibility mm -hmm. to make that child responsible, honest, uh, and progressive, and to take care of their um, academic uh, future. Mm -hmm. So this is what they believe. Now I think it's it's the culture is actually very different. But I do want to talk about misogyny before we go on, because the general impression about patriarchy and misogyny is that all Asian women are oppressed. Same here, and I think there was also some mention of toxic relationships and so on. In my book, I've written a whole chapter in misogyny where I have covered all of this. Mm -hmm. I have started with the West oppressing its women. And you know, in the West, for hundreds of years, women were burnt as witches, witches in th at the stake. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to understand that women's position was terrible in the West for a very long time. Mm -hmm. 
it changed within a hundred year period and, the, and the, we need to learn right. from that hundred year period but that's interesting because any woman who would stand up for something right. that she believed was her right they would immediately burn her labeling her as a witch so that has been happening True. but wha- uh, just as a personal question do you think taking an example from the west would propagate this message better in our part of the world because we tend to look up to the west when you talk about rights and everything like that. You see, as I've lived between two cultures, I can tell you there is plenty of positive in Western culture Mm -hmm. and there is plenty of positive in Eastern culture. Like I've said before, when I uh, have gone through various phases of my life Mm -hmm. and I have read a lot, I've read a lot, I'm very highly qualified in England, but every time I've had a decision to make, I've remembered something my nani said. And my nani's wisdom overrides everything and the reason I'm a very successful woman personally and professionally, I've also been married for 30 years to the same man. Mashallah. And that is because I have used my nani's wisdom even in my own marriage. Mm-hmm. But this book is not about me. This book is based on research about other people. Mm-hmm. It's based on research by proper psychologists who have done research. We cannot write a book unless we base it on research. Because I can think anything, that's my experience. Other people may not identify with mm-hmm. that. I live in a very different society. I'm used to freedom of speech. I found in Pakistan I have to be very careful what I say because it can be misunderstood very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. When I talked about patriarchy and misogyny, somebody commented, she sounds very confused. I think (laughs) politically correct culture is a lot more predominant in the West, the wokeism and the cancel culture. I think. Well, let's agree to disagree, I think. (laughs) But the fact is that, you know, I'm very intrigued about the... uh, obviously the parenting part it, it, mm-hmm. it becomes very close to me as well uh, so on a very personal level do you think one thing that has been wrong throughout our society and you know what we've done is uh, like you mentioned you know there was a talk about toxic or even the word itself means very negative things so you know these jargons that are there is it important to have a lot of positivity spread positive vibes talk about things that are positive in your house right okay you've used the word wrong and you've used the word toxic yeah. what i say in my book is we must not judge people. Mm. We must try to understand them. So for example, I can say that you as a man are toxic. Mm. But I haven't tried to understand you. I have to look at your childhood. I have to look at your upbringing. Mm. I have to see what made you toxic. Now when you were a child, and you and your sister were playing, if your sister fell down, your mother said, oh my poor baby, uh, and she goes and comforts the the daughter. Mm. When you fall down, she says, get up, you're a man. You're a man, be macho, be Mm. a man. Don't cry like a girl. How can you avoid growing up to be toxic? Mm. So we have to understand what's behind it. it, And then change that. Mm -hmm. And you know, women play a very big part in changing. Instead of complaining what is, Mm. change the future generation. Change the life of women in the future with the way you bring up your son. Mm. If he falls down, go and cuddle him. Tell him, bitter, don't cry. It's okay. We all get hurt. Men and women all get hurt. Mm -hmm. But don't cry. Don't tell him don't cry like a girl. Don't separate him like that. Don't make him a robot who Mm. has no emotions because then he will grow up to be toxic, I'm afraid. So we need to understand. And then another uh, uh, distinction I've made in the book is between Feminism and the way feminism is understood in the East and the West. And the West yeah. In the East, feminism is, with a lot of respect to you and all the women of Pakistan, mm. if you wear Western clothes, you speak English, you have a cigarette and you swear. That's progressive, that's Western, particularly smoking, which is mm. very antisocial in England. In England, feminism is that every little girl has the same opportunity as every little boy to go to school, to have employment, to have equal rights in voting, mm to have equal rights to health, Mm. and essentially to have equal rights to all opportunities. Progress is a woman growing up to be independent and having her own income. Mm. Now, if women want to smoke, if they want to wear Western clothes or speak in English, that's fine. That's their choice, and I'm not going to put that down. But please don't associate that with progress and feminism. Mm. True. Because that's not feminism. That's a misinterpretation it's a of it. That's, that's, right? a, that's a wrong connection, you see. Mm. And you mustn't do that. And, and then I've, um, I've written a whole chapter on men and, and how men can be understood. Do you know there are a lot of illnesses that only affect men and not women? Finally, somebody speaks <laughs> up about that. And <laughs> I've also written a chapter. I've written one on misogyny. Mm. I've also written a chapter on philogyny. Mm. Now, just like misogyny is a hatred of women, philogyny is the love of women. Mm. And I have highlighted men who've done amazing things for women out of love. King Edward, who gave up the throne for Mrs. Simpson. I've written about Shah Jahan, 
who built the Taj Mahal. Now let's not look at the negative side of it. Let's just focus, because you know in everything, there is some positive. He built a monument of love. Lovers from all over the world go to from that monument there. and then they say they'll be together forever. Actually, for just our audiences, can you just show the book and we can see the cover as well. Uh, so the book is called A Love Letter to Men and Women and I think it is wonderful. And of course, we've been told that we're very short on time, but Ms. Uma, it's been very intriguing. I wish this discussion could go on and on. Uh, people must get their hands on this book as well. It's my love letter to men and women. Mm. It's a love letter from me. Wonderful. Because as a barrister, I have seen acrimony, I've seen horrible relationships, and we need to sort them out for our children's sake mm. in the future. So uh, this book is to give you a message of harmony. You have to start from a loving place. You have to keep forgiving again and again, and you have to bring about loving relationships everywhere not just between men and women but in every relationship that's true that's true and that uh, i mean also includes the environment uh, i exactly. mean all the non-human being mm. things so animals yeah. everything around everything. you i think everything and around you the way you behave right. but thank you very much thank it's been so, so much. intriguing and you know you feel uh, yourself getting uh, reformed spiritually as well right, at right. the same time mentally spiritually you feel that connection that right. you know gosh I, I i really think i can make a difference and in a very good way to this society but like I said, thank you very much for being on the show. On that note, very we'll welcome. take a short break. But when we come back, we've got something very interesting to discuss. Stay tuned to World This Morning. Welcome back. So Emma, I, really want, uh, I wanted to ask you this question because, because he keeps telling me, do not say, I, I really want to ask <laughs> you. So I try to be consciously do that, but I think it will take some time. Uh, there's a buzzword around the entrepreneurship and a lot yeah. of people are venturing into this field, and especially yeah. the fact that people can do the work sitting inside their homes. Mm. They do not have to go out to the offices. They're their own so boss. Yes, <laughs> yes. And this thing is really reverberating, especially for the millennials mm. because they're their own bosses. <laughs> they don't like to work under the bosses. Uh, have you ever th thought of starting up an entrepreneurship? I wanted to buy Twitter, but then this good old <laughs> chap from you know Tesla and the fa okay, SpaceX. Okay, you have beat very me. high dreams, <laughs> beat me to that. So that was probably my one go of thinking. But you know, I think there are a lot of opportunities, and I, I hate the misconception where people talk about that. Look, uh, there is no progress. You know, there is no success rate of doing a business in this part of the world where one person, and uh, you know, uh, I'd like to give him credit because I've, I, I've spent a lot of time with him. Uh, we are related, of course, uh, on my dad's side. Okay. Uh, his name is Ibrahim Javed, and he had a great philosophy. He always said that there is so much untapped potential in the market. All okay. you need to do is have the right knowledge, have the right education, and have a right you know, teacher or a coach to tell you how to tap that potential. Okay, wonderful. So have you thought about, I mean, tapping into that market? Yes, a lot of times, but trust me, this is a very demanding <laughs> field. <laughs> right, right. So um, I think we need to have a more conversation on that because the uh, youth entrepreneurships are spurring a lot of job mm -hmm. for the young people out there. And it is a totally different environment out there, right? So in order to have a more conversation, we are really glad that we have been joined by someone who happens to come from the U.S. and he is going to enlighten us, who happens to be Rahil Shea. He is a serial entrepreneur and investor based in USA. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming to our show. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed and Hajra, both of you. Well, and good morning. Nice. Well, I think we should call you the money man now. <laughs> after <laughs> we've heard everything about you. But let, let's, let's talk about this entire concept now. You know, since quite a while, entrepreneurship, not just in the West, right. but in Pakistan, these startups and everything has been 
you know, at such a pace that it's very, very difficult to actually not cope up with it. So you, if right. you're not joining the bandwagon right now, you're going to be left behind. So right. how have you seen all of this, uh, you know, uh, development in this sector? Sure. Um, uh, see, Ahmed, uh, when, when it comes to the entrepreneurship and startups, so the biggest ch uh, challenge or biggest thing which, which comes to the f uh, first thing which comes to the people's mind is what which you open up your speech with which means when she asks you about the entrepreneurship, you, there are two things which comes in your mind. One, you want to get rid of nine to five job. Mm. And the second is you want to buy Twitter, which means you want to buy uh, something bigger. Mm. I know you, you said it on a light, lighter note, but this is what the, uh, the dilemma going on in the Pakistan startup system as of now. Uh, first thing we need to understand that entrepreneurship is not about getting yourself out of nine to five jobs. Uh, because you get out of 9 to 5 job and you start, you adopt to a 24-7 uh, mm. kind of a working mm. model. Uh, because there is no entrepreneurship uh, which gives you, sorry, which gives you a work-life balance, uh, mm. let's say, at least in the initial struggling stage of their entrepreneurship era. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, especially in the Pakistan market currently, I have observed uh, recently, uh, everybody wants to start big. Um, yeah. When it comes to the startups or entrepreneurship, the first thing comes in your mind is, oh, you know what? I mean, I'm gonna make a next Facebook, or I'm yeah. gonna build up a next shortcut Twitter. Shortcut to billionaire. Yeah, he exactly. wants to buy a Twitter. <laughs> he right? wants to buy yeah. a buy a Twitter. I've got um, no shortcuts. <laughs> I know there is a lot of planning ahead. There is a lot of struggle. There yeah. is a lot of grinding. There is a lot of hustle which you have to go through the stages, and then that the time comes when you reach to the point where the success is yours. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand the whole uh, uh, phenomena before you even reach to that success level. Another uh, issue about the startup is uh, we, we are so fearful and afraid of failures mm -hmm. that the only thing comes into your mind is that we need to do the, uh, we need to win the success. You pick up any biggest uh, startup of the world, whether it's Eastern or Western or Pakistani or USA or wherever, there is no uh, founder or entrepreneur who has achieved success in his first trial or a first uh, venture. Mm -hmm. So which means we should not be uh, uh, fearful uh, about the failures when it comes to the startup or entrepreneurship. It's all about how uh, well perceived uh, you take an idea, you put a risk involved. See, the, why, why I use the word risk is because the whole entrepreneurship concept is based on the risk involvement. Mm -hmm. If you take the, if you eliminate the risk out of the entrepreneurship, that becomes a traditional business, which I call it as a boring business. Yeah, the, that's the old idea. school traditional boring businesses like you uh, you know my dad has a shop or my dad has a factory and I just you know take it that in inheritance mm -hmm. and then I continue doing that that's a boring business as of now in youth they like they like the the new uh, startup systems and the startups does not come without the risk management so risk has to be involved we need to get prepared about it and uh, that's the only thing which you need to work on, uh, whether it's a uh, startup in Pakistan or in the Very West interesting, world. because success is fun, but failure is your teacher. Yeah. So I think mm. to normalize uh, this, Hajra, that you know right. it's okay to fail. Right. We're, we've only been using this that failure is not an option. It's not like that. True. You know, it probably teaches you many more things that you can never That's imagine. True. That's true. And how ca you can change your track, how you can change your strategies in order to have a more successful one. So, mm. Absolutely. Uh, youth entrepreneurship, let's talk about that. Yeah. Because youth entrepreneurship has a multiplier effect. So they are going to hire a lot of their peers, young people out mm -hmm. there. What is the ecosystem in Pakistan? Uh, see, the, the youth entrepreneurship, as I would say, in this uh, startup ecosystems, it's, uh, there is a huge potential when it comes to the youth. Uh, we do not have a lack of uh, talent, uh, I believe, strongly, I uh, believe, in Pakistan. Uh, we, uh, only the issue comes in where we, do, we always uh, creep about or blame about the overall infrastructure. The, because, mm -hmm. see, for every business or every ecosystem, the startups, we need to have a certain parameters from the state-wise, from government mm -hmm. side, policy-wise. Policy policy yeah. wise. We need to have that the, the uh, logistics and infrastructure built up. Unfortunately, we are a little bit lacking behind uh, uh, in that system as compared to the Western world. And that's the reason we call it as an emerging market. We are mm -hmm. not, a, uh, you know, the mature market like US. We are in an emerging market. So what I believe is rather than uh, the youth should believe that rather than creeping about the lack of opportunities, we should start finding what are, our, what are our strengths, what are our resources, with whatever the available resources we have, we need to work on that so that we can expedite the whole things mm. and we can build a whole ecosystem based on that. Well, 
it's very important then to understand because like you mentioned two of the biggest problems right now are everybody wants to shortcut shortcut and their mm. understanding of a real entrepreneurship is mis you know let me be very clear like he mentioned that mm -hmm. you know like rahil said if your dad owns a business and you take it over you inherit it and then you transform it by taking it digital that's not entrepreneurship you know right. that's just something that you've gone with the wind but changing the trend is the real thing so what are your pointers for success i mean uh, obviously we do understand the challenges but considering the dynamics in pakistan uh, lack of decisions on the policy wise they have tried creating incubation centers some of these uh, projects and uh, organizations but in this part of the world realizing that you know this is the system this is that's what, what we have yeah, that's what we have yeah. what's the real way forward here see what i strongly believe uh, it's not only the responsibility of the youth okay i have i have gone through the you know i have listened to the different uh, uh, talk shows and the different people talking about everybody talks about either they they, they blame on the government or the policy side which i'm not here to talk about or they are all emphasizing on the whole agenda on the youth uh, it's a youth responsibility to take the ownership what my belief is the youth which is, our education system is poor we do not have a strong education mm -hmm. system unfortunately again so which means the youth does not have the current and right exposure so if the youth does not have an exposure but they still have a talent and mm -hmm. they have because today we are talking about globalization there is so much accessibility where you can sit here and you can uh, search a research a deal or interact with any biggest company in the west so there is a globalization happening so i believe that more than the youth's responsibility it is the responsibility of the riches and the elite of the society because they have crossed a certain uh, tier stages in their life so all those riches and the elite society who are uh, so much engaged in building their individual wealth they should come forward create a system why why you put everything on the government or on the mm -hmm. state or on mm -hmm. the on the establishments you need to work on the things that the the person who are blessed who cross their first tier uh, stage they need to come up uh, come forward they have a bigger vision they have a bigger exposure so they create a system they need to build more in incubations they need to create and build more startups they need to invest more startups they need to create a training centers for the youth so mm -hmm. that the youth can learn match the pace with the with the western world and then they can collaborate together yeah. so basically as like a trickle down effect True. exactly yeah. exactly True. so talking more about the uh, social entrepreneurship do you think it's a viable route for the young people in pakistan absolutely social entrepreneurship is again another our our social responsibility as well True. Uh, rather than picking and identifying the social issues we need to find the opportunities in that social obstacles and the cur current conditions which we are going into the country mm -hmm. so for example if you talk about the uh, financial infrastructures mm -hmm. or if you talk about the financial instabilities of the country why don't you uh, pick up a cause and create a startup like a fintech or mm -hmm. these kind of uh, uh, startups on that issues which addresses you and that that creates a, a lot of value towards I the social i think that success rate is more than any other sector absolutely yeah. absolutely because once you once you pick up the social issues and then you create a solution around that corner mm -hmm. so which means you are already tapping to the masses so when you reach to the masses and that creates a lot of that adds a lot of value towards your uh, the success of your uh, startup yeah. obviously in ahmed i do feel that there is this mindset especially with our parents generation who always says that go for the government jobs because there is stability in that right mm -hmm. and considering the fact that uh, 90% of the entrepreneurships they fair i mean there is some substance to their this thinking so how do you deal with this sort of thinking and especially for the people who aspire to have their own startups Uh, uh see that's again another dilemma that you know the the parents are always focus go for a government jobs mm. right. uh or if if i mean this is what exactly happened to me right. i i i i got uh, you know a, a very distinction grades when when i was in school in my uh, you know in my schooling life and the whole family of pressure oh you have to become a doctor or an engineer <laughs> or a thesis officer or, or yeah. exactly <laughs> uh, exactly so i think in this system the parents and the 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 senior society uh, the senior uh, community of our society they need to get educated and they need to give the flexibility and freedom to the youth to decide where they want to go mm. i'm not against the concept that they have to give their inputs because they got more better experience and exposure but with due respect today the generational gap between me and my ancestors for example 
it's too much that they cannot they have no idea what the startups are going on mm -hmm. or what kind of a current entrepreneurship uh, uh, era is going on they have absolutely no control and not, no feedback to give me to decide which career path should I choose. Mm -hmm. So I would believe that let the youth decide. You give them a, a, a basic uh, consciousness, yeah. values. Uh, value. Yes. They need to understand what is right, what is wrong, and then let them choose their own path. Absolutely. Because that's the only way where the, the young generation can decide what, what is their way forward rather than going for a government office job or <laughs> whatever the case. Rather is. than going for stability. But Rail, thank exactly. you very much. It's been very intriguing hearing all of this discussion, Ajra. Uh, right. I, uh, does that make you want to start, uh, you know, your own entrepreneurship journey? I mean, well? I don't have that very business there. I'm more into <laughs> reading, writing, and I think I'm. You could have a startup about startup. reading and writing. You never know. I that's, mean, that's, that's another. That's about. another one of the issues, by yeah. the way. That people <laughs> believe, oh, I'm uh, very comfortable because I'm not uh, ready to take that. I risk, think that you need to have yeah. the right sort of passion to start. And I don't have right. Exactly. Right. Adra has the right sort of passion for research, so she could have one of the best research startups ever in the world. You never right. know. Why but call it startup? Why not call it something tech or university? No. <laughs> she wants okay. to stick to that stability part. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> it. But Rai, okay. thank you very much. It's You're been very interesting right. and I think a lot of uh, thank you so inspiration much for comes from your journey as well. And I think the youth really needs to get in touch with Rahil and you know take benefits from their experience as well. And of course, uh, before we go, I want to take this opportunity to you know salute you and the entire team of World this morning thank because you, they're no them. less than entrepreneurs <laughs> themselves. You know, every morning Thanks. putting up an effort, getting the show on board. So right. this is a special shout out to ev the, all the team. Right, and I think our executive producer take a lot of pain so that uh, our show is on the time and it's on the best quality. And I think he uh, deserves a lot of applause. <laughs> and especially producer and everyone, our PR, the team members, and the uh, intern. He's doing a wonderful yeah, job, Mr. right? Just then. Uh, yes, it has been. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, before we uh, close up our show, I want to talk about one more thing that yeah. men and women face different sort of challenges mm. in the entrepreneurship, right? Women also face a lot of cultural barriers, but I think right. it's a very exciting field. And things are getting changed because you can have a startup while sitting in your comfort mm -hmm. of your home. Absolutely. Of course, you need a lot of research, you need a lot of your mm -hmm. homework done and you need a lot of focus to get that started. Absolutely. I think but Raja mentions a very, very important point. And on that note, I would like all of you to write to us. Uh, right. Do get in touch with us on our social media platforms, of course, of Twitter, Facebook and YouTube as well. Right. And do let us know what do you think about startups and what's the biggest hurdle that you feel stops you from going into that realm as well. On that note, we'd like to thank each and every one of you for staying tuned. And of course, uh, we'll see you in our next show again. And from me and the entire team, it will be goodbye, but with a good morning. morning.